Okay, so the topic of this presentation is proteins, and we'll also focus on amino acids and enzymes. Let's go ahead and get started. So when we talk about uh, proteins, they're, they're one of the four categories of organic molecules, along with lipids, along with carbohydrates, along with nucleic acids. And they're used in a very wide variety of cellular activities and cellular functions. You know, for example, the process of DNA replication, where one piece of DNA is used to make two pieces of DNA. There are various proteins used in this method. Also, the process of photosynthesis, you know, where plants take in sunlight and they produce glucose and oxygen. Uh, but photosynthesis has various stages where proteins are used as well. And then the process of mitosis, you know, where cells multiply or divide. You know, this one cell goes through a process called mitosis to make two cells. There are various proteins used along the journey. And then also cellular respiration, the process of the mitochondria creating molecules of ATP. A wide variety of proteins are used in this process as well. So proteins really have their hands in pretty much all the actions that cells perform. Now, when we look at the basics here, um, the building blocks of proteins are, are little units, little monomers called amino acids, and they have some weird names to them. There's an amino acid called leucine, and it can bond with another amino acid right here called valine, and we call the bond in between the two amino acids, we call that a peptide bond. And then maybe a third amino acid bonds together, maybe a fourth amino acid, and there's 20 different kinds of amino acids. You can see some of them have some uh, weird and interesting names here. Tyrosine, lysine, histidine, serine, and all of them held together by what's called a peptide bond, which is why the entire chain is called a polypeptide. Poly is a prefix that means many and many peptides. And so this is a, a peptide or a polypeptide here. Now, the process of your cells building a polypeptide is uh, created by the ribosome of a cell. So here's a little ribosome right here. And what the ribosome does is it gathers these amino acids, forms peptide bonds between each of them, and keeps gathering and gathering and gathering. This is the process of protein synthesis right here. And so we have two polypeptides now, one in orange, one in green. And proteins are formed often from a collection of polypeptides. So both of these will twist and fold and wrap around one another to make a final protein. Now, the exact arrangement of these amino acids is very important and crucial to the overall protein. And so if the polypeptides are made with the proper amino acids, then the protein will twist and fold and wrap into its proper shape. Let's go ahead and copy and paste those two polypeptides again. Now, look at the green chain, three, two, one. What if that last amino acid was changed, was mutated from one amino acid to another? Well, when the two polypeptides twist and fold and wrap around one another, because they're made from, uh, even though it's just one wrong amino acid, the protein takes on a different shape and the function of the protein is altered. One of the key concepts is that shape and function, form and function are related. And so if the form is altered, then ultimately the function is altered as well. You know, a good example of how this can be detrimental to one's health is the disease sickle cell disease. You know, normally red blood cells, like you see in the picture here, are round, almost like frisbee shaped and they roll through the veins and arteries and they're carrying oxygen more freely as they're round and they roll. But people who suffer from sickle cell disease, you can see that the red blood cells almost look like flattened bananas. And so they don't roll very well. They're uh, more likely to be clogged in veins and arteries. They carry less oxygen. So the per persons uh, have poor blood circulation. And this is caused this whole problem is caused because the person has a misshapen protein uh, caused by uh, the wrong amino acid in this protein called hemoglobin. So the arrangement of amino acids is quite crucial 
to the proper functioning and shape of the proteins. Now, if we break down amino acids in a little more detail, uh, you know, what's an amino acid? Well, it's the building block, the monomer of a protein. And now, there's 20 different amino acids, and again, they have weird names to them. There's one called alanine, one called valine, one called lysine, one called methionine. But there's 20 different amino acids, and, and each of them have little different characteristics. For example, the ones in this box are nonpolar, which means they don't have charges on them, and they're hydrophobic, which means they're not attracted to water. In the green box, these are polar, which means they have charges. They're hydrophilic, which means they're attracted to water, and they have a neutral 7.0 pH. In the blue box, these have a basic or an alkaline pH. In the reddish box, these all have an acidic pH. So they each have different characteristics, and that's one of the reasons why uh, proteins can be so unique is because they're made from different combinations of them. Now, when you look at the uh, atomic structure of amino acids, uh, they're organic molecules, so they're, they're going to be built around carbon and will have hydrogen and oxygen in them. Also, some of them contain nitrogen, some of them contain, contain sulfur. So these elements here are constantly, or these atoms here are constantly being broken down and reshuffled to make the various molecules that are in our cells. Well, so here's a ribosome, and, and if I were to ask, you know, how do amino acids bond with each other? Well, the ribosome helps in the process of dehydration synthesis. So here's an amino acid that the ribosome gathers, and here's another amino acid the ribosome gathers. And through a dehydration synthesis reaction, watch the two H's and the O in red, three, two, one. The water is removed, and the two amino acids bond together. The ribosome can bring in another amino acid, and the same thing happens. In a dehydration synthesis reaction, water is removed, and the amino acids have bonded together. And this process continues until the whole polypeptide is formed. So if we were in class right now, I'd give you a minute to talk about these questions with the neighbor, and then we'd go over them together. But for now, you know, pause the video. I'm going to try to go over these answers in three, two, one. So number one, what are the building blocks of proteins? Well, those are the amino acids. In the picture, there's one amino acid named serine. Serine happens to be one of 20 of these building blocks. The third one, which organelle of the cell will gather these building blocks? Well, that's the ribosome. What's the bond in between these building blocks called? That's a peptide bond. Which process would bond the serine that's pictured with another amino acid? Well, that would be dehydration synthesis. Now, number six, which disorder is caused by an improperly created protein? That's sickle cell disease. Number seven, which of those three terms, protein, amino acid, or polypeptide, is the smallest? Well, that would be the monomer, the amino acid. Number eight, which of those three terms is the largest or the biggest? Well, that would be a protein. And number nine, what helps to determine the function of a protein? Well, that would be its, its structure. Now, as we said earlier, proteins go through a folding process. A, a protein is often made from multiple polypeptides. Here's a, in the picture, again, a polypeptide is a long chain of amino acids. And as we said also earlier, that uh, they're, they're assembled, polypeptides are assembled by the ribosome. The ribosome gathers one amino acid and joins it with another, and that's through dehydration synthesis. And so here's the ribosome again, gathering amino acids one at a time, and through de dehydration synthesis, the amino acids bond with each other to make a polypeptide. And after the polypeptide is assembled, it'll twist and fold and wrap around each other. And so here are three polypeptides, one in red, one in green, one in blue. Each of them will begin to fold and wrap and twist around itself. And then after that, they then begin to wrap and twist and fold around each other until they make a final object called a protein. Now in this next picture right here, this is actually a computer model of an actual protein. And see each colored ribbon here, you could see are the various polypeptides that are twisted and folded and wrapped. But the entire structure in the entire picture, well, that's the protein. 
And so the final shape, as we said a few times, allows the protein to perform its function. So it's very crucial that these uh, polypeptides twist and fold and wrap properly in order to make a protein. Well, we know that lots of foods are high in proteins, and so certain foods where proteins that are more common, for example, really any kind of meats, whether it's a steak, whether it's any kind of chicken, maybe it's fish. Also, beans are, tend to be higher in proteins as, as are eggs and, and as are nuts. Now, when we consume food, of course, goes into our stomach. Here's a protein that enters into the stomach. And then at this point, now the proteins uh, begin to break down and unfold and untwist and unwrap. And we call that denaturing. The proteins begin to denature uh, mainly because of the digestive enzymes within the stomach. And then as the uh, proteins and polypeptides move on from the stomach into the intestines, now they're going to be met with, uh, with fluids from the gallbladder and fluids from the pancreas, and they're broken down even further into their am amino acid building blocks. And now the amino acids can enter the bloodstream and be transported all around the body. So the literal phrase of you are what you eat your food gets broken down into these building blocks, and then the building blocks are sent all throughout your body to build you up. So again, the little, literal interpretation of you are what you eat. Now, if I were to ask you during the pro process of dehydration, this is where we would expect to see a hydrolysis reaction. That peptide bond right there with the addition of water can be broken to break away the amino acids from each other. And there is another water molecule which breaks down uh, the, uh, the amino acids even further. And to finish this up, the last slide to mention are enzymes. Enzymes are a special category of protein, so they too are made from polypeptides that are twisted and folded and wrapped around each other. Now, the job of any enzyme is to lower the energy needed to start a chemical reaction. This graph is a really nice graph that shows this. The red line shows a chemical reaction without an enzyme. Notice the big red hump in the, in the graph here. That shows that a lot of energy is needed to start the chemical reaction. Now, in this blue line, the blue line shows the same chemical reaction, but notice how the hump is a lot smaller much less energy was needed to start the chemical reaction because in this case, an enzyme was used. So the same chemical reaction is performed with much less energy. Enzymes are beneficial in lowering the energy needed to start a chemical reaction. Enzymes tend to be really sensitive to their environment. And so what we mean by that is they can be denatured and broken down when they're in conditions outside of their normal. So for example, here's a protein exposed to the normal body temperature of about 98.6 degrees. The protein is folded and twisted and wrapped and uh, able to perform its necessary function. But let's say you have a really severe fever, 105 degrees. This could be life-threatening. This is probably worth a visit to the ER. But what happens is in this extra warmth, the, the extra couple degrees begins to cause the proteins to denature, to break down, because enzymes are really sensitive, proteins are really sensitive to their environment, and they begin to denature and unravel. And now, now this protein's function is going to be altered, if not lost. And so if a high, person does have a high fever, uh, this explains why, uh, you know, their body starts to feel very miserable and uh, why a, a trip to the ER could be uh, in their future. Enzymes are very specific in their actions. They do very certain jobs. And that's because if you look at this enzyme, there's this active site, the site where an object called a substrate actually fits into the enzyme, much like a lock fits into a key. So the substrate enters into the enzyme and has to fit perfectly. This is why enzymes are very specific. If they don't fit, if the substrate does not fit into the enzyme, then there is no chemical reaction. And now the bond in between those two molecules can be broken. And uh, there you go. The enzyme has fulfilled its function. Now, here's a molecule of hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. 
and there's an enzyme by the name of catalase. Catalase's job is to break down hydrogen peroxide. Notice how hydrogen peroxide fits perfectly into the active site of catalase. And then three, two, one, the hydrogen peroxide is broken down into harmless um, molecule of water and oxygen. But here's another different molecule. This is a molecule of starch, and there's a different enzyme by the name of amylase. Amylase is great at breaking down starch. And so here's a bunch of amylase enzymes, three, two, one, that break the starch down into the glucose monomers. So if you need, if your cells need to break down starch, well, they'll use amylase. If they need to break down hydrogen peroxide, they can use catalase, but enzymes are very specific. They do very specific jobs. There are no one, there's no one enzyme that does every single job. Enzymes are reusable. Here's again a molecule of starch, and here comes some amylase enzymes, and three, two, one, the starch is broken down. But those same amylases can break down a second starch. The same amylases can break down a third starch because enzymes are reusable. And there you go. I uh, hope you found this video helpful. You know, try this practice quiz. And if you're in my biology class, I'd love to check your answers before or after school one day. Thanks for watching.